I'm Wayne Bouchard. Uh, my wife Christine's in the front row. We've been, we came to Naples about 15 years ago when we fell in love with this village, especially the history of it. And so we became active members in the historical society and under Trisha's leadership right now, um, we're doing some amazing things. So I'd like to take you through the Naples Mill, um, past, present, and future. Um, it, I realized when I signed up to give this talk a few years ago, at least the first version of it, I didn't know anything about mills other than you drive past them, they're beautiful, and the water wheel's on the outside. But before we actually came to Naples, my son was doing a concert in one of the little concert halls here, and I had to park my car somewhere to come watch him. And I parked in front of this beautiful old building, and I thought to myself, well, that's pretty strange. An old building like that, like a mill-looking building in the middle of a parking lot in the middle of Naples, no water anywhere. And so I just sat in my car and stared at it for a while and thought, that's a very interesting building. And tonight I'm gonna to talk about it. <laughs> it's amazing how the world, you know, how life just follows you around. Anyhow, so um, let's go to the next slide. Um, this is something written by uh, Bob Verheil about the mill. And I think it's a really great tribute to it and a nice place to start. So the site of the Naples Red Mill was picked because it was just off of Main Street and was right on the Naples Water Raceway. Ah, a little clue where the water came from. And there was plenty of parking for wagons in this area. So in 1815, the Red Mill was completed. It was a full-service grist mill that attracted people from the entire area because of its modern grinding equipment, 1815, and the high quality of its products. It had the same kind of attraction to the people of, of the 1810s that Wegmans has today. People came from miles and miles around Naples to get their grinding done at the Red Mill and to do their shopping on the Main Street drag. In just a few short years, the corner store would be built, which we lost two years ago to fire. That was the Lions uh, store. And also in 1819, Bronson Lion had built a very fine hotel, which is what Trish talked about early about the, uh, before the Jocko Hotel was the Lions Hotel, um, had built a very fine hotel right there where the Naples Hotel is located today. Local businessmen wanted to be part of the action, and in just a few years, the Gordon Block was built, which are the, the stores right there um, on the corner, and then the Naples Valley Professional Building. It seemed like there was a new building going up almost every month during the summer of 1819. Say what you want, it's our business, the mill, that draws them to Naples by the wagon load, Simeon Lyon said. And that's true if you think the original Naples started up by Bob and Ruth's up there where the Cleveland house is. And that was built like a, a New England square. You had the, the church, which isn't there anymore, it's now a park, and the cemetery, and that was the square. That's the original settlers of Naples, that's where they went. And then after a while, they started dividing up the lots, moving south. And uh, so today, the, some people say, well, where is Naples? Is it that end or is it down in the south end? And this is the reason why, it was because of this mill because people were coming here and this part of town started to grow faster than the original part. So the Naples Red Mill was the finest milling operation for miles around. The mill had all kinds of grain on hand that could be sold to farmer and resident alike. The Red Mill offered flour, feed, bran, and cornmeal at the best prices anywhere. It was well known for its burr, ground, graham, and buckwheat flour that Naples housewives turned into the best tasting pancakes that any man's stomach could digest. Again, this was written in the 60s, so. <laughs> the male cooks that. While you're at the mill, I'll be doing my shopping, many wives told their husbands as the weekly trip to the mill and Naples was unfolding. The Red Mill became the mecca for business and gossip. While the women folk were bartering for their groceries and millinery goods, the men folk were trading stories at the mill. It was a dirty place where the women kept their distance and gave the men the freedom to swap stories and hear the latest gossip. It sure beats going to church, Erratus Hamlin once said. The men like to come here because they don't have to get Sundayed all up. And the sermons here are never dull and boring. So today we don't think about mills, but in the 1810s they were the providers of the staff of life. To the unfamiliar, the word grist was commonly used to refer to farmers to indicate used by farmers to indicate the feed they gave to their farm animals. It was made from wheat, oats, and corn. The Naples mill ground up the grains, mixed them together in their own special blend, and, blend, and sold them under their own brand names, their own brand name like Naples Best. The Naples mill would also custom grime a far, grind a farmer's grind, grain formula. <laughs> 
Once the farmer would pay for the grinding by giving the mill operator a percentage of the ground grain in payment. So that gives you a really good description of how important our beloved red mill is. So let's go to the next slide. So the other thing I realized, as I may have said a minute ago, was that I didn't know how a mill worked. I mean, they don't really use those that much these days. And so what I'm going to take you through is a couple slides to explain to you how the mill worked. Um, so you see a mill, you know, this is from Wikipedia, so this part's modern, but a mill, also grist mill, grinding in, uh, up grains and things for, for your animals. Corn mill, flour mill, grinds grain into flour. The term can be referred to both grind, the grinding mechanism and the building that holds it. Okay, so let's go to the first slide. Okay, the water, so by the way, I owe some of these pictures to the Boy Scout troop up at Grimes Glen. They put together a beautiful display, and I took pictures of it and then described some of the things that they had on there. So it all starts with water. Okay, that part I got. The Naples Mill got its water power from the Grimes Creek and the Lions Mill Pond off of Vine Street. This aqueduct was called the Mill Race because the water raced down it. Um, one of the most important things you'll see is that there's always a pond, a mill pond, because just a stream isn't enough because, you know, the water fluctuates. You really need the head, head pressure of a nice pond. So there was a mill pond. On the sign there, it says it was up where the parking lot is in Grimes Glen, but the, go to the next chart. Um, if you can go to the next slide. But if you look at this, this, this is the 1859 map of Naples. Okay, so you have to kind of help, I have to help you along. So this is Vine Street. Here's Grimes Glen, so we're traveling east going this way. You can see how the water, then they diverted it, and they had a mill pond right here. So where's right here? <laughs> so they were right that it was a parking lot, but here's the, the church we're in. There's where the mill pond was. I mean, it might have been one off screen there, but there was definitely a, a, head, a mill pond right here in the parking lot of this building. It then came across... Vine Street, but Vine Street wasn't actually here. Vine Street didn't connect to Main Street back then. It just went right into Elizabeth Street, but it came down and it ran along Reed Street. Reed Street. Then it ran right under Mill Street, which today we call Cross Street. Then it ran behind, all the, behind the buildings um, or along Wall Street. Then under, Wall, under Lyon Street, which right near Betsy's house. And then she's there. So a matter of fact, I think it's where Betsy's house was or is, and then it went behind the other houses, kind of where the, the school is here, the school, now the big school, went underneath Main Street, where the gas station is, then went down, there were a bunch of mills there, under Ontario Street, and then caught back up to the Naples Creek. So that was where the race was. There really aren't any signs of it today. So let's go to the next slide. And this just pretty much shows, this is the 1874 map. So we have these maps, if anybody wants to see if their house is on it. Um, but it's pretty much the same in 1874. The thing that changed, of course, is that now some of the streets are called something like we're used to, Cross Street, and things like Vine Street now goes into Main Street, and now this is called Mill Street, even though today it's called Race Street or whatever. <laughs> the names of the streets changed in Naples all the time. So if you're doing research, it's really difficult. You have to realize what year you're in when they say that, oh, that's the house on Race Street. Okay, well, Race Street's not the same Race Street. Okay, so let's go to the next page. So these are some mill race stories, because it actually, here you've got this water system going on through the village. It's really interesting to hear some stories about it. And as some of you know, I bought the Maxfield Inn, and it was actually built by the Luthers, and Blanche got me the diary of Sumner Luther from 1850 when he lived in the house. And in his diary it says, in the afternoon I went over to see young converts baptized in the race back behind the Christian church. There were six baptized. In the evening I went up to the old Lion prayer meeting. So they were baptizing, oh, I got rid of the map, but right around Lion Street used to be the old Christian church, and they would baptize people in the race. Sometimes it was in the ground, sometimes it was elevated above the ground. Um, another one, this one's from 1898. During the storm Monday afternoon, the mill race broke over the bank opposite John Lewis's residence and swept down across Race Street and through the gardens and surrounded the buildings below. Another one, this is an 18, 1904. Yesterday, the mill race overflowed on the Pottle Homestead, which a lot of us know where the Pottle Homestead is, that's famous, in North Main Street, covering nearly the entire lawn. Another one here in the bottom left talks about a large tub is standing on Main Street, which is to be put in the ground near Granby stores and connect with the underground, an underground pipe brought from the mill race. 
by Mr. Jacqua. So this is, by the way, the bucket that you have in front of the Naples Mill right now. This is how they fed the horses. They also used it for fire. That's what he's talking about here. We still have that, that container. It was 35 barrels worth of water and will be a great service to the public in case of fire. So anyway, that's, that's another thing the race was used for. And then this last one, which is really cute, 1899. Last Monday, the three-year-old grandson of Sher Sherman White Wheatland was following his grandfather some distance behind. Near the residence of Lewis, of C.S.L. Lewis, the little fellow fell into the mill race. The water was high and he was being swept downstream when Mrs. Lewis saw him from her window. She ran out and rescued him just as he was about to go under the bridge. So the mill races also have played a big role here, but obviously it was important to, um, to the mills. So let's go down to the next slide. All right, so water wheels. The Naples, what kind of water wheel did the Naples mill have? Turns out there's four different kinds of water wheels. They can be internal to the building or external on the building. There's overshot where the water comes to the top of the, the water wheel and then these little flaps, you know, basically fill with water and the wheel turns this way. That's called an overshot. There's an undershot where actually they put it in a stream and the water actually just pushes the wheel and that gives them the rotation. Another is this, I can't really read on here, something Brett Scott, because the resolution isn't good enough. This is where the water comes into the side and then pushes the, the wheel that way, and just by gravity. And this one's pitch back. This one, they kind of come up near the top, and then it does similar to what that one does. So the, the red mill, if you go to the next slide, is overshot. Okay, so the water came in to that building, similar to this picture, and inside the basement of that building was a huge water wheel. And so if you go to the next picture, it was down here in the basement. So a lot of people don't know, and especially most of you that aren't allowed in the red mill like we are, this is where the big wheel was. And there's remnants of it still there, not the actual wheel itself, but the overshot or the, the, the race part that went to the top of it is down on the floor of it. And there's channels down there where they channeled the water over the mill and then out the back. And so it's pretty fascinating. You can see where they mounted the uh, bearings and things for the mill. So that's down in the basement. And here's the raceway coming in. So there was an elevated raceway right through the parking lot. And there'll be some pictures of that in a minute. Okay, but as you can see here, this water wheel is connected to a whole bunch of gears here that drive things going vertical up to the top. A lot of this is still in the mill today. The third floor is pretty much intact in a sense. A lot of the original equipment's still up there. And then down here, um, obviously, it still it drives the grinding stones, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So we go to the next slide. So how flour is made. First, the grain brought in by the farmers is dumped into a trap door on the first floor where it falls into a catch bin in the basement. So they load the grain in here, and if gravity takes it down here, and it just starts to fill up there. Okay, if you go to the next slide. I'll just stay here. It's then carried up to the third floor by the grain elevator, which is driven by the water wheel. So the trick is to get this grain all the way up to the top and then use gravity in the process of bringing it down. And so pretty much the process used water power to move things up and gravity to move things down. So they had these chutes that they would shoot the, the grain up and these elevators, and I'll show you the next slide shows what they look like is there are little buckets on a leather belt, little buckets. And this is a pulley, and these little buckets would go down and scoop up the grain and bring it all the way up three floors. This one's at the top, the bucket then comes around, these little scoops, because this is driving like, it's on like a pulley, and then these little scoops would dump it into the container. So it's pretty, pretty fascinating. They, they really are quite a, every one of those little scoops are carved. It's really amazing to see. Okay, let's go to the next. So then the grain is dumped into the grain cleaner, which I really don't know how that works, but then down the chute to the millstones on the first floor. So they dump it into here, it gets cleaned, and then this becomes, again, a, a group, a pile of grain prior to milling so that it's a, like a capacitor. It fills up so that this can go at different speeds as they're dumping things in. As long as they have a nice set here, then it can come through and be milled at a constant rate. Okay, so those are where the millstones were. They were basically right on the second floor there, which is really the first floor from the parking lot. Um, then we go to the next slide. So this is a blow up of millstones. So here are your stones. This is actually a very large 
system. It's got a wood frame. Here's your, where you dump the, the grain from above, the clean grain, into the hopper. Then these, this, this runner stone rotates, and the bed stone, which is the bottom stone, is stationary. And the grain goes through the middle, and it gets caught into these in between, and it can't go this way anymore, so it goes this way, and as it goes from the center here out, while, these wheels, while this wheel's turning, um, it goes and gets ground up and then goes to the next, the next thing. So if you go to the next, and then, yeah, so you can see here that there's special grooves in that millstone, um, and these are carved in. So like even when you drive down Route 21 toward the lake, somebody's got one of these standing up next to their mailbox, and you can see how beautiful the work was to make this a, a grinder so that the, the grain would come through here and work its way out. It's pretty clever. So it, that's what ground up the, the grain. Here's a picture of one, you know, because obviously it's all enclosed. Okay, we'll go to the next. The grindings fall through the floor to the catch bin basement below. So now they're back down in the basement again. So we go to the next. So it's then carried up to the third floor by the floor elevator. So the same system they had here to bring the original grain up, the ground grain pieces were then brought back up to the third floor again by the water wheel through the gearing system. It is then dumped into the flour dryer. I guess some moisture is given off after it's ground. Go to the next slide. Then um, again, it travels down a chute to the bolter, which today we would call a shifter, like, you know, like a flour shifter. It basically separates the thicker flour. You, know, you can basically get any kind of fineness of the flour you want in, this, in the shifter. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see one. Um, this is a shift, a sifter. So these are the, the screens. They're usually made out of silk, and they are a different fineness, and that's what gives you your fine flour. And if you remember in the beginning part, I talked about that Naples had the best flour around. So we all wonder, you know, why is that? Um, so anyway, these silks were really special, and they were stored typically in a really special cabinet because they, they were the, really the, the heart of the mill in the sense of the quality of the product. So if you go to the next slide, so while, so next to the mill, there's an old house, and our friends um, own that house, and they were digging through it, part of the restoration, and they came across an old box that looked kind of like this. Now this is the mill house, so the, the milliner actually would live in that house, and then he would work in the mill and run the mill, and so the built that house, we're not sure how old it is, but maybe 18, 30s in the back and 1870s in the front. This was stuffed in one of the walls. So I Googled it, Alwood Wider Six Swiss Silk Bolting Cloth and Extra Strong. So this talks about the fact that maybe the secret for that mill was that they were working with Swiss. They actually got their silk bolting from Switzerland um, because this box was found um, inside Mike and Jerry, June Terry's house uh, as part of the installation. So that might be part of the secret. They weren't just using any old silk to strain the flour here in Naples. They were actually getting it. It says here, silk bolting cloth for milling purposes is primarily a Swiss specialty. Notwithstanding the attempts that have been made to make it in France, Italy, and Germany, Switzerland, and I'm sure the US, practically supplies the, Switzerland practically supplies the requirements of the world in this time. So there you go. So that's a little bit about the sifter. Now if you go to the next slide, um, after the sifter, then, um, it goes downstairs to the bagger, which is right here, which can either put it in bags or barrels on the first floor, which is good because now we at least end on the first floor, so then you can just roll them out into the carriages <laughs> instead of ending on the basement or the third floor. Okay, go to the next. Here's an example of a bagger. Um, it, the automatic bagger could be set to cut off flow when the bag hit a set weight of 2, 5, 10, or 25 pounds. So the flour would come through, this would be an automatic bagger, and there's your famous flour bag. All right, let's go to the next slide. So, Red Mill passed. So that was a little history about, how, or at least a story on how mills work. So now that you're an expert on that, let's talk about the past of the Red, Naples Red Mill. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the oldest photograph that I know of of the mill. Some of the differences here are the, the fact that the little, what we call a railroad station thing on the side isn't there. It's a, 
uh, just a solid porch. It's interesting to see, this picture was taken, we think, in the 1870s. They still had broken windows. <laughs> Maybe they like pigeons or whatever it is, but that's the really old picture of the mill, um, the, the oldest photograph. I, I really wish photography had invent, been invented 100 years before it was, because all the research I do, I can't really see pictures until 1860, and all these people I've studied, I'd love to see what they look like. Anyway, okay, let's go to the next. So in, 18, in 1792, the mill race was built by Benjamin Clark in 1792. So this is the mill race and Jabez Metcalf um, to feed the Ontario Mill, which is where I sit across from the school today, where the gas station is, where they just put that big concrete pad. That's where the first mill here in Naples was. That was the Ontario Mill. Um, Lyon's Mill, which is this one, was built by Simeon Lyon. It was the third grist mill in Naples. So where was the second one? And the second one was actually the Luther Mill. Simeon, you know, the, the Luther that I mentioned before. They live on East Avenue today, which they used to call Water Street, for those of you that do research. And so they, just off Water Street toward the Naples Creek, they actually ch cut a channel in to be able to run the Naples Creek closer to East Avenue. And that's where they had a mill. And so there was, that was the second. This was actually the third, even though 1850 is pretty early. Um, the Lion Mill was built by him, as I said, it's the third one. Then in 1822, Mr. Fisher becomes the miller and after time moves into the mill house. We talked about the mill house already. Um, it was a little bit different then. There was, you'll find out later, there were two mill houses. Um, then Simeon Lion dies. So he really had that mill, he ran the mill for 20 years. Even though it's just two sentences, it's quite a bit of time. And then, so then his son, along with three other people, took over them. Two, three people bought in to the mill, and so now you've got four people that own it in 1834. 1849, Watkins sells his interest as Mr. Hamlin. So Erastus Hamlin, that's him. That's, I did find a picture of him. Um, in 1849, Watkins sells his interest to Hamlin. I read that. 1849, 1851, the Lions Mill was remodeled, rebuilt by E. Hamlin, or no, Erastus, and S.C. Lyon, the son of the original builder, one of the best flowering mills in the country, now called the Naples Mill. New machinery was installed, so it changed its name from the Lions Mill to the Naples Mill. Okay, next slide. Um, then in 1870, I'm trying to go faster because it's a little boring, really. 1870, J.P. Lyon bought E. Hamlin's and later S.C. Lyon's interest in the mill and added steam power. So I thought about that, you know, okay, so they added steam power, and you'll see in a minute, it's on some of the pictures that I have. Why would they want steam power? Because this is way before they stopped the water wheel thing. And I think it was because a lot of times the water wasn't available because of the fact it froze in the winter. It's good to have a backup power system. They would have a steam turbine, and so it would probably be powered by kerosene from my ex history of understanding what kind of fuels they used back then. Um, it probably wasn't any kind of natural gas. So I think they used it mostly as a backup. I, I think the water was still the main purpose because they continue to enhance the water wheels. So you think, why would they do that? If they but anyway, that's why. Um, Woodruff becomes the new miller in 1872. A new overshot wheel, water wheel was constructed. So then they put a new wheel in, commissioned by J.B. Lyon, joint owner. Then J.B. Lyon moves into the new mill house, which is the one the Terry's live in, which has been added to, to and made into a good residence. That's why I said it's kind of two parts. That's why the older part and the newer part. And then Woodruff moves into the old mill house. So for those of you who are historians, like you've got the history there. What's interesting to the, a lot of the rest of us is that these little articles here. So it says, J.B. Lyon Proprietary has been having a general overhauling its line shaft put in proper running condition, et cetera, by William Van Houten, the machinist here. While Mr. Graham, colored, was holding up the shaft with a bar, it slipped through the bar to one side, knocked him over, and removed, no, and then some, I can't quite, maybe you can read from there better, breaks and the loss of some of his favorite, his double, his best double molar. So it basically hit him and he lost some teeth. So, and the, you know, I have this story from Sumner's diary where he said, it was a terrible day today. Mr. Armstrong tried to fix the mill and he lost his arm. It got caught in the, it got between the, the millstones. So it was a dangerous business, you know, when you're dealing with wooden heavy things and a lot of water and stuff. So it's, they had, they had a really busy time. Okay, next, next slide. Um, the wall about the wheelhouse has improved to make it uh, quite free from freezing. That would have been right here. They tried to insulate that because obviously they're trying to run the mill year-round 
it's kind of hard when you've got water over, you know, working with water. Uh, the mill general overhunting line shaft was put in proper running condition by the machinist and Van Houten. I just read that article. Uh, Mr. Woodruff leaves the mill. His father becomes the miller and moves into the old mill house. There you go, Terry's. Um, then um, old Woodruff returned to the mill, kicked his kid out, and has moved into the old mill house. So there was a switch there of family. Oh, I keep thinking I've got to go over here. All right, let's go to the next page. And then, um, so here you can see a video, a picture of some of, from one of the old maps of the Naples, or the Red Mill. Here's the water wheel, and they say it's 60 horsepower, overshot, um, grinding and cleaning. And then here's where the backup power engine was behind the mill. Today this is just grass area. And then there was a shed. And uh, this is just a picture of the mill taken from in front of the Naples Hotel. And this is the horse carriages that were driving the stagecoach. So this picture goes on, but there's a stagecoach. You can see the Red Mill here. That was probably taken at the, around the t turn of the century, a little before. Um, and then Clark built, buys the mill and installed a roller process for grinding wheat. Now it's called the Naples Roller and Exchange Mill. And I've got a slide on that. Um, Dollar Height, a first-class miller, rents J.B. Lyons Red Mill. The old mill tenant house, basket factory, and Morgan House Hose hose and ladder truck house, which is next to the Morgan Hose building, um, burned down to the ground. So they lost, um, that's kind of where the parking lot was. We lost, they lost a lot of buildings there. And the old mill, mill tenant house disappeared. So there have been a lot of fires in the Naples time frame. But if we go back to this question about, okay, I told you about all the other kind of milling, but what does this roller and exchange mill change by adding a roller process? So if you go to the next slide. So corn meal roller mill. The hopper is on top, so they feed the, the grain or the, the corn into there, um, where there are two sets of rollers. The first roller crushes the grain into meal, and the second set of rollers makes the meal finer. The leather belts are attached to the line shaft that are powered by the wooden water wheel. The visible pulleys drive the power off the rollers. So it's another way to make a different kind of um, flour, I guess. So, okay, if you go to the next slide. So it now becomes the roller, um, the roller mill. So then Clark dies, and then his son takes over, changes out the water wheel, and puts in a turbine. So I thought, what is a turbine? Go to the next slide. <laughs> then you can see on the map there, it's a turbine wheel. So a turbine wheel is this. So somewhere along the line, they put in a turbine wheel. And it's a very high efficient, so it's the new technology. That's one thing I can say about Naples. They always kept up on the new technology. We we're finding that more and more. So this was the latest technology. What it did was it was almost like a little bit of a jet engine. The water would come into these buckets and it would funnel to the center, which then forced the water out harder. So they could get, what does it say, two to four times more power, or just as much more power, out of this kind of water wheel than the original one. So this is the third water wheel that was installed in the red mill. Okay, let's go to the next page. Almost done with this part. Uh, 1906, Clark dies. B.L. Clark owns the mill, then Slayton buys the flour and feed mill from them, and then Eddie Howitt became the miller, the miller, and then James Slayton owns the mill and substitute electricity for water power. Notice that sometime between 1910 and 1920. And then because of that, in 1920, the water was forever shut down from the mill race. So the mill race was removed at that point. So 1920 is how long the mill race was there. And so, um, and then there's the next page is just an article about that. Basically, people were happy to see it go. It was making too much of a mess. People's lawns, it was overflowing, and they were really happy to see them take down the old uh, raceway. And also, you know, people now could plant flowers in their front yard instead of seeing that thing going through, and they were thrilled to get rid of that old technology. So, 1921 or so. Okay, so go to the next, because I don't have to read that. Now, before I move on to the next section, while I was doing the research, of the Red Mill a few years ago, I ran across this article. And for us, that people like me that do a lot of historical research, even though it's not on topic, it's worth me reading this to you. So just take a break for a minute. <laughs> so I was just looking up things, and then I came across this, and it says, this is, it says, buried alive almost. Hmm. We are indebted to C.M. Beecher of the Fremont for the following. The Fremont was another newspaper. A single case occurred in the town of Ashford on Monday last, which, as near as we can learn, is that a German child, about three years of age, had for some time been seriously ill of scarlet fever. And on Sunday morning last, to all appearances, it died. At least it was pronounced dead by the attending physician and preparations were made for the burial. 
Monday afternoon, the funeral was held and the body of the child, accompanied by a large amount of friends, was conveyed to the grave. As the dirt began to fall upon the coffin, a feeble cry was heard. The coffin was instantly raised and opened and a shriek of mother burst from the lips of the resuscitated child. And my favorite sentence of any reporter ever writing, and this was in 1860, it is useless to attempt a description of the scene that followed. <laughs> I can only imagine. The child is in a fair way to recover. There you go. Okay, back to the other topic. So if you go to the next slide. All right, now we get to uh, 1930. Um, there you've got now a building that's kind of been sitting there for 10 years and making um, flour. But now Widmer's bought it and used it for storage. So they actually did some changes inside, moved some of the floors up and down and things so that they could store barrels of wine or whatever they stored there. Then in 1965, so they only for 35 years, 1965 donated the mill to the village of Naples. Okay. Then in 1975, Bill Verheil bids and buys the Red Mill for $2,300. And then in 1980, Bill Verheil turns the Naples Mill into a museum. So good for him. We still, of course, have this Red Mill Museum sign, and we can use it again someday. And there's Bill Verheil. And so this is all about his dream. So if we go to the next couple pictures here, and we'll just go through the, oh, actually, this is a, a picture of what it looked like when Bill bought it. You can see the 1960s cars out front. So he bought himself quite a project, and he tried to do what he could to fix it, patch it up, and turn it into a beautiful museum. And he did an outstanding job, he and his brother. Um, and of course, it's been the collection center for most of the historical artifacts of Naples. So it's chock full of, you walk through there, you walk down memory lane of Naples. So let's go to the next slide. So present, um, let's go to the next one. So this is Brilver Heil. And John Murphy, our current his town historian, um, walking through the mill. So really, I think John Murphy gets credit for Bill Verheil donating the inn, or the inn, so he's saying that, the Red Mill to the Naples Historical Society, which he did. Um, John talked him into that, said, we will take care of it, we will cherish it, we will protect it for you, Bill. Um, you know, because I remember Bill came over to see me in, in the mill, and we had, or at the inn, that's how I was supposed to say it. And he came over, and I, we just bought the in and the pipes were busted because nobody drained this water out of the house before they left and got foreclosed. And so the big huge steel pipes were on the ground full of asbestos in the basement. And Bill says, I want to go in the basement. And I said, well, it's really dangerous down there. There's asbestos everywhere. He says, Wayne, I'm 97 years old. I'm not going to die of asbestos. <laughs> and he just took off down the stairs. And he was like 7'2", you know, so it's like he's ducking. He's going down here. He was running through there. Anyway, that's Bill. So. We knew him and loved him, anyhow. So John talked him into to donating the, the Red Mill to us. So let's see what it says. Berva Heil, Naples town historian, has donated the 19th century mill and the contents of the Naples artifacts to the Naples Historical Society. That was an article from the Messenger Post. So thank you to Bill and thank you to John. Go to the next. These are just some pictures of inside the mill, since none of you really get to see that. There are other models, not just the one outside. You can see some of the old signs. So I think someday my wife, my wife's sweet blessing sign will be hanging up in there. It's kind of one of my dreams. All right, the next, uh, of course, a long time from now. Um, so you can see all the different signage that's in there, all the different exhibits that, that are in there. Uh, let's keep going. Just Bill showing his flag collection. We're so fortunate that we got these pictures uh, that John made happen before uh, we lost Bill. So this, this is a tribute to him and his beautiful museum. I don't know that was Kramer over there. No. Okay, let's go to the next. Um, here's some more Naples signs. Some of you may recognize some of these if you were here long enough. Um, it's chock full of things. Let's go to the next. More slides. Um, there's an old sewing machine there. What he really collected a lot is on the wine industry. We have almost a full set of basket making equipment and all the things associated with wineries. I even found Widmer's original records. All of their book keep all their book records are in there. So like what happened during Prohibition? It'd be nice. To, so I have Widmer's records during Prohibition. It was very interesting. Okay, well it's another topic. Um, and so they can see more. So you can see why I got so wrapped up at the historical society. You walk in and you see this. It's just treasure chest of historical items, um, sometimes five of the same thing even. Let's go to the next. This is an old popcorn maker. The entire sweet shop is in there. Um, I recently was, you know, the family that owned the sweet shop 
had a lot of glassware and tables and things, and we had a few of those, but we have all the equipment to make the sweet shop ice cream and all that. Bill collected all that when the sweet shop closed, um, which is not there anymore. It's where we have the outdoor plays and st or outdoor band concert things today um, in the old movie theater. So that's there, and we have the glassware. We could actually reset up the sweet shop, so we could get everything to work, but okay, that's in there. Let's keep going. So um, these are pictures now, what I took just two or three weeks ago. You can see it almost looks back the way it was when Bill bought it. Uh, we've been doing our best to try to keep up on it, and, and, and um, Trish will talk a little bit about that. But we did some siding, and, and Woody helped me put that up, and tried to keep as much of the animals out as we can. Actually, the cats that live under my carriage house, I can watch them every day walk over to the Red Mill and keep them. <laughs> <laughs> they cut across the street and they run up there and they keep the animals out of the, the red mill. So anyhow, that's it's in dire need of help, and it's our you know our responsibility at the historical society to make that happen. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. We're almost done. Future. The next slide. So our future of concept, and it's really based again off of what Bill's vision was, is to create a living linkage to the past that will serve as a central focus for historic learning demonstrations, meetings, gatherings, restoration classes, historical culture awareness, and to provide a glimpse into the Naples of the past. And as you can see, this, built, this, this uh, model was built in the 1960s, 1969, I think, by the um, School of American Craftsmen in RIT. They actually had a special class project. They came down to Naples and saw so much potential that they came up with a whole bunch of new ideas for some of the old buildings here. This was the Red Mill, and it was donated to us, um, and so it's outside, and we've been trying to keep it restored. It's 50 years old now. So if I go to the next slide, um, or if you go to the next slide, uh, we talk about some of the ideas that we've had. And again, this is the cutaway side of that Red Mill model out there in the lobby. So we talked about on the top, you know, permanent museum draft displays. We do have a lot of, uh, like I said, originally of the, of the um, the mill equipment, some of it's stored up there. Some permanent signs, because we have a lot of beautiful signs from old Naples. And maybe a milling display talking about how the mill worked. Down on the first floor, maybe a changing display exhibits, permanent signs on walls, event hall, maybe open the sweet shop. Again, this is just was our ideas, and we really are interested in ideas that you might have. Uh, permanent, on the second floor, permanent museum displays, life and times, the 1800s. Again, more permanent signs on the walls, and maybe in the basement, a place for meetings, workshops, large item displays, vehicles, and maybe even put back a water wheel since we have the big gully for it and all the bearings there. Um, maybe a couple of craft people would like to build a water wheel. So that's really the slide I end on, right? Trish, I hand it over to you at this point. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> now, wouldn't wouldn't a Naples History Museum like this be nice? This was Bill Verheil's dream, and the Naples Historical Society would like to see his dream become a reality. A reality. And I think it's so wonderful that we're here in the clouds thinking about it right now. Um, since Bill donated the mill to, uh, to us in 2015 with, vo 2015 with volunteers and existing funds We've obtained a structural condition assessment of the mill. We've made repairs on the roof, remediated an inf in infestation of powder post beetles, added a handicapped ramp, repointed some of the basement stone walls, replaced a wooden door and frame on the lower level, moved a collection storage container to the rear of the mill, improved drainage around the exterior of the building, and Wayne has spent many hours replacing sections of the siding. But the time has come now to stabilize the building and replace all the siding. This is a costly endeavor, and we need your help. Tonight, we are announcing a $100,000 capital campaign drive. We have a good start on reaching a goal. That's the good news. We have approximately $30,000 in our capital reserve account, which was created with the proceeds from the sale of our former tin shop property. We also have a very generous board. And uh, with donations of funds and in-kind services, uh, our own board members have uh, raised over $11,100. 
The campaign will run through the end of next year with stabilization occurring then and hopefully reciting of the, um, uh, of the siding, replacement of the siding in 2025. After that, the next phase will be schematic planning and interior design. This is where we need your help tonight. In the lobby at the, uh, at, at, during our reception, you'll see board members with name tags. Uh, and I'd like you all to talk to them and tell them what you would like to see in the mill. Would you like to see something like this? Would you like to see something different? Do you have other ideas? We are willing to hear everything and we are wide open um, at this point. So I encourage you to think about it and to go enjoy some champagne and wonderful desserts made by our board of directors. Thank you.